Hello everybody, this is Phoenix Sunday. If you didn't know already, I'm currently making my own game. It's a two and a half D platform with a high focus on speed, agility, and momentum. The movement and combat are going well, but there is something vital that's still missing, the art style. I wanted to implement my unique art style to my game. And I'm proud to say that after many, many hours of bashing my head into a brick walls, I think I have a process of implementing my art style to my game. In this video, I'm gonna go through every part of the process, and I mean every part of it. This video is partially for me to flex my process and art style, but it is mostly to inspire others to find a way to implement their art style into their games. So hopefully this could be a resource to someone in the future. A quick note before I go into this insanity. Don't take this video as a tutorial. Yes, I'm going to go through every part of the process, and I'm going to be showing off sort of everything I'm doing and explaining everything, but that's exactly what it is. My process for my art style. The intention of this video is to inspire you, not for you just to copy it step by step and just make something the exact same and learn just nothing. To make something new and original, you have to think outside of the box a little. So hopefully this video can serve as a sort of puncture point to the box you may be stuck in, because I know I was stuck in a box for a while figuring this thing out. Another quick thing. For my 3D modeling software, I'm using Blender, and for my game engine, I'm using Godot. However, the concepts of the process should be able to be applied to any 3D modeling software, any game engine. It's really just a process that can be generalized to anything, really. So let's get started. To demonstrate my process, I will be implementing this axolotl character right here, this axolotl cultist, into game form. Although the character's not going to be in the final game, it, <laughs> he doesn't really fit anywhere, I do think he serves as the perfect sort of, I don't know, character or perfect host, perfect test subject to show off my process. All right, the process can be divided into nine sort of main steps. Face modeling, rigging, UV unwrapping, normal map manipulation, texture painting, base outline modeling, exporting and importing, the model shader, and the outline shader. It's a lot. Some of those are pretty similar to like other game processes, and then some of those are pretty weird and unique. I'll be going over each step. Timestamps for each of them are in the description of the video, and if YouTube doesn't crap on my video, it should be divided up to chapters as well. So step one, the base modeling. The first step is the base modeling. Here I'm going to only focus on sort of the base shape of the model, nothing else, no detailing. Well, details as in like the sword or the knife and the robe and the necklace, stuff like that, but really it's just getting the base model down. You could, I really think you could use any technique for this. I personally prefer just to use shapes because I'm not really too worried about super fine details, so I don't need to do any of that sculpting stuff. And since my art style is sort of built up of these basic shapes, like the head here is pretty nice and ovally, the, I don't even know what you call these, the things on the sides of the head are really simple shapes. Overall, just really round, simple shapes that build up my characters. So I don't think I need to do sculpting. I can just sort of put it all together. Now, the next step, once the base model is complete, is rigging. Rigging is pretty self-explanatory. You just build up your rig, your skeleton, whatnot, and just sort of put the whole thing together so you can animate it, pose it, whatnot. Pretty simple step. Pretty easy, in my opinion. It's just think about where you want to put your bones and sort of how you want to connect them together. So step three of my process is UV unwrapping. This is where the process begins to deviate from the norm a little bit, but not by much. I create multiple materials depending on the object's pseudo properties. As you can see, I already sort of did that out of habit. But essentially, the skin of the cultist is a different material from the eyes, a different material from the knife handle, a different material from metal things, a different material from crystal, rope, ropes, yada yada. Essentially, if that part of the model is going to react differently to light and all that stuff, then we create a different material and a separate UV map for that. After the whole material stuff, the UV, the UV unwrapping goes as normal. I just make sure to, the seams aren't in terrible places. I highly, highly advise not to use your automatic like seam maker or whatnot. The automatic UV unwrapper is okay, but when we are doing normal map manipulation and all that stuff, it doesn't work out that great from my experience. Maybe I messed up something else, 
but I do recommend just going in by hand and doing it. After we are done UV unwrapping, we can move on to the next step, normal map manipulation. This is where all normal stuff goes out of the window. Normal map manipulation is the most tedious, most painful, yet arguably most important step of the process. Manipulating the normal map is what gives the model its distinct texture and reaction to light and shadows. So by default, models are simply shaded depending on their faces and all that. Normal maps allow you to tell the renderer to react differently to light, usually by adding texture in things such as bricks, scales, etc. Usually for realism. However, by artistically manipulating the normal maps, you can make models react to light and shadows in a sketch-like way. The original concept of manipulating normal maps like this is from this video right here by Cody Jinji, or Cody Gindi, I don't know how to pronounce your name. But that's where the original idea comes in for manipulating normal maps to create this painterly-like texture. Link in the description, go check out the video. They do a much better job explaining how and why this works, but I am here to show off my own version of it. In my opinion, I've done a lot of significant improvements, especially for my own art style, but check out this original video if you want to know where the original idea came from. So the first thing to do is to bake object normal maps of our model. Usually normal maps are in what is called tangent space, where the normals of the normal map are applied locally to the model. Here, we want normal maps in object space, which instead represents the normals as they would appear from the object. I usually name these images with the ending O and M for object normal map. The O and M images are then fed back into the model into the surface texture. This allows me to use Blender's built-in texture painter to better manipulate the normal maps according to the model and the flow and the cut-up UV and yada yada. A custom brush is then created. Nothing too fancy, just a normal brush with some color wrap noise to add texturing. Then each colored sketch line is drawn into the normal map of the model, one at a time. Why? Because this gives the best results. I know how my models are supposed to flow. I know how the flow is supposed to go. I know how the texturing is supposed to be. Blender doesn't. Therefore, I am the one who has to do it. Each colored sketch line has to follow the general color of the object normal map it's colored over. So you don't want to completely obliterate the model, but you do want to make it so that its normal map is very, very different from just smooth. One tip if you decide to do this, use a drawing tablet. I don't care if it's the cheapest one you can get. Just do it with a drawing tablet. Mouse is going to kill your wrist and your finger very, very quickly. So once the normal map is painfully but passionately colored over, the images are finally fed into the model as object normal maps. But this doesn't really work because you can't really move the model, you can't really pose it. So what you have to do, you have to then feed those into the object normal map of the model and then bake new tangent normal maps. Finally, we can feed those tangent normal maps into the tangent normal map of the model. And finally, it is working. As you can see, lighting, shadows, and all that are now very unique and stylized, just like my art style. Oh, great grief. <laughs> the next step is texture painting. This one isn't too important since most of the texturing and detail of the model comes through the normal map manipulation, but it is important for things such as gradients or eyes or other things like that. The next step is the base outline or base outline model, depending on which one you want to do. The main sort of idea was stolen from this video by Tony Mortero, I think is how it's pronounced. And essentially how it works is that we create a separate model or modifier onto the base model, and we use backface culling to get the outline. And then for the scratchiness or messy part of the outline, we use a vertex group and manipulate that. So first I create a separate material that is emission so that it doesn't receive any shading because shading on an outline just doesn't look that great. And then I create a new vertex group and assign all the vertices of the model to that vertex group, also named just outline. Then I use a modifier with some cloud texture to manipulate this group and to make it so that the vertices are either like strongly affected by the group or less strongly affected by the group, whatnot. Just manipulating it, making sure that it looks very scratchy, very messy. And then with the solidify modifier, I 
make it so that it only modifies this outline vertex group, and it creates the messy outline. However, do make sure to set the material to backface cooling and the solidify to flip normals so that it only shows the backfaces and doesn't just create a cloudy mess of a model. And then if you want to create a separate model for the outline, just make sure to duplicate it, separate it, subdivide it if you really want more vertices, yada yada. But essentially make sure that it is still affected by the rig or else it will just completely break apart. Then it is time to export the model and import it into our game engine. So what I like to do, I like to set it to export only selected and select the model, the rig, and whatever accessories because the way I model in my 3D software is that I make a lot of backups and just a lot of mess. So I set it to export only selected and I make sure to not export the materials already baked in. Like they are already going to be replaced with shaders in the game engine. So I just don't I just don't worry about trying to export materials. I just put them as a placeholder. And also make sure that the modifiers are being applied or else none of the stuff you did will even work. After that, I like to create a, another folder, which is just sort of the package, because you have to export the model and import it into the game engine with the tangent normal maps and the, whatever textures you made. So I just create a separate little folder called package or whatnot, and I just chuck that straight into the game files. The final two steps are the model shader and the outline shader. I'll first be looking at the model shader. So I have the outline sort of transparent for now until we get there. Now, apologies, it's going to sound like I'm rambling. This part is sort of unscripted because I have to go into the shader and explain things. So first of all, I've constructed the shader in a way where I can simply just customize it how I want for every single sort of pseudo material. So for example, this right here is the skin. It is simply use surface texture, yes or no. It's no because it is simply just this pink color. And then we have the normal map and the normal map depth. So like how much the normal map affects it. Don't go too harsh on this. And then these are sort of where the special things come in. So it's divided into two main things, you know, the fragment and the light shader. Fragment is pretty simple. It is simply just, hey, are we using surface texture? Yes, then use the surface texture that we import right into, right into here. If no, then use the main color. As I've said before in this video, all the detailing comes in through this reaction to light and shadow. So usually a single color works, but for those special cases such as eyes and gradients, it is good to have that option. Now the lighting, this is where the real chaos begins. I'll turn off the crystal light for now so we can just focus on this yellow light here that's affecting our model. So how it works is that it is essentially taking the dot product of where the light is coming from and the normal wherever it is. And since we already put on the normal map, it already calculates all that for us. And then this is where chaos ensues. So usually how this would work is that it would sort of look like this. Not too great. Why? Let me turn off the speculator as well. There we go. This is how it would look usually. Not too great. Why? Because it's trying to light it realistically. And artists are not really good with realism. Well, some artists are, but my art style is definitely not realistic. It includes these harsh shadows, this really vibrant light. So what we do is that we essentially take this dot product number and we start tweaking it a little bit. So if I jump over to Desmos, this is what it would usually look like, sort of. So pretend that this is sort of the number that we get from our dot product, which is sort of how aligned it is with the light. Zero being completely perpendicular, one being completely facing the light, negative one being completely facing away from the light. Usually it would go from zero to one over here, and then once it reaches zero, it'd probably just stay at zero for the shadow. What we want is, to make it so that the light affects it sort of more smoothly and so that the shadow is a lot harsher. So it's divided into two different segments. One is if it's positive. 
So if it's positive, instead of looking like this straight line, it will look like this, a cubic function. So instead what happens is that instead of just going harshly to light, it will curve sort of like this, which causes this nice effect right here where the light is sort of phasing into it. And then over here with the shadow, we have it being able to go into the negatives, but not by very much, which is our shadow right here. So the negative portion, I'll probably just clamp this just to make it a little easier. There we go. So that's our positive portion. And then our negative portion looks something like this. So our shadow ray, let's see what's the shadow ray on this cultist here, on the cultist skin. It's a uh, 0.04. There we go. And I'll clamp this as well in the negatives, just to make it a little easier to see. So there we go. This is how it looks like in the negatives. Usually shadow is only allowed to stay on zero, but here we allow it to slowly go down into the negatives. Why? Because then we can get this really cool effect where a yellow light causes a purple shadow, or a white light creates a black shadow, etc., etc., etc. Why do we want this? Because it adds a little more interest, if we didn't have this, like if I just completely take this part off, it would just stay zero. We want that extra colored shadow to add just a little more pop. So after that, we multiply by attenuation, which is essentially just, hey, shadows in the environment, distance from the light, yada, yada, yada. And then we multiply it by the light color so that we can actually you know, get the yellow, or in this case, when it goes positive, yellow, when it's negative, purple. Pretty nice. Then we add it to our previous diffuse because diffuse shaders are able to add lights together. So if I add multiple lights to this scene, it will actually work and not just completely break. And also if I just change the color of this or whatnot, we don't want it to break completely. We want it to actually add the lights together in a pretty cool manner like this. So I'm gonna delete this for now. There we go. And then I set a sort of clamp so that it can't go over one or else it'd just be glowing like crazy and so that it can't go below a max shadow so that in case of those multiple lights, it isn't just going darker and darker and darker. Okay, so that's the first part of the light. However, the second part is a specular. This part is also important. If I disconnect this, it just looks disgusting. Specular, how that works, is that it's sort of the shine-ish. You'd be thinking, well, usually things don't shine. Well, in this case, I am using the shine very, very, very softly to make it sort of colored like this. If I don't have it, it simply just combines the yellow with the pink, and it sort of looks a little disgusting. And if I start changing colors around, like, for example, I make the skin sort of, let's say, uh, let's say the skin is, like, red or something. It looks disgusting, but just watch. And if I make the light sort of a green or whatnot, it just completely blacks out because red, well, because red mixed with green is just black. It just doesn't look good. And this is how light works, but artists don't care about how light works. They care about what looks good, or at least I do. Some artists care realism. I don't. I, I don't give crap about realism. Like, just make it look good. So I'm going to change this. Actually, I'll leave it like this just for demonstration purposes. So let's say our light is completely green like this. The specular is the shine. What we are doing is that we are adding just a tiny bit of shine so that it will give off that green. It is shining just a hint of green. And even though this doesn't happen, this isn't how light works, it looks a lot better. It just looks more artistically pleasing to have just that little more green or a little more light on it. So if I change the color to like blue or something or like, yeah. Change to blue, we have that little blue shine, and then it goes to actual combination of color and yada yada. So that part is very important. I, I should probably explain it. Let me change all the colors back to what they were before, though. Okay, so you're going back to a sort of light pink. There we go. So the sh specular or shine, how that works is that we once again grab the dot product of the normal and the light so we can see how much it's facing the light so we know what, what to do shadow, when not to. And then we set a tiny little offset. This offset essentially makes it so that 
the shine is either moved more towards shadow or more towards light. So if I go over to specular offset and start moving that, you'll see the shine going way over the model or way to the very, very tip. So then from there, we once again use exponents. So if it is less than zero, we simply just cancel it out. So I'm going to close these for now. So usually specular would either be either this line or it'd be like a set amount. What we are instead doing is that we are doing it by a power of four, which what this does, I will once again clamp it. Which what this does is that it creates this really nice effect where it goes sort of from no shine to very big shine or whatnot. However, if you notice here, we're using the subtract. So if I write the actual equation down, it would be something sort of like this. Like, let's say the specular offset, if I remember correctly, is 0.1, that to the fourth. It creates this really nice effect where it's sort of offset a little bit. If I didn't have this offset, it would just be straight at zero like this. If I add a lot of offset, like one, Bam, it is never reaching that because we have the clamp where it can't go like below zero or whatnot. I forgot to add the clamp again. Shoot. Okay, there we go. There we go. Or no. You get the idea. We are essentially using this power to offset a tiny bit so that when it goes up to its max shine, it will actually do it in a smooth way instead of just disgustingly. Because if we take off this power and we just do this, it just doesn't look that great. It, it doesn't work at all. The power helps sort of smooth that out. So then we go over here. We obviously multiply by attenuation again. And then we multiply by light color. And then we add the previous specular and done. Not that difficult. It isn't that complicated mathematically. It is just small little tricks to make it really smooth like this. And plus the normal map, it really does this really nice effect of shadows. If we take away the normal map, if I just go over here, put the normal depth to like zero, yeah, sure, the shading looks really good, but it is that normal map manipulation that really brings it out. And this is done in all of them. So all of these have different, val have different values. So like the skin is sort of these values right here, but then the eyes, I did set it to use a surface texture and I imported a surface texture and then I, I essentially just tweak these values trying to get things right. The values are simply just either making the shadow, like I'll show it on the skin actually, it's probably a little easier to see. Like the max shadow you can have, you can even set it to like negative or whatnot, max shadow, how much, how like how fast it goes dark into shadow. And then you can even go to the negatives to make weird effects, but I prefer not to. Like how fast it goes in the shadow, how much shadow it can have max, specular offset, and then the multiplier. This right here I forgot to mention. The multiplier essentially is just something right here in the front that makes it so it doesn't go to one because uh, a specular of one is just way too shiny. Like if I go over here and set this to like 10 or something, that is way too shiny. It works with gold and stuff, but for skin, that just does not work. So I'll just set it back to like it's 0.1 or 0.2, or just tweak it a little bit till I get it look, till I get it nice. And since we are adding the previous light, previous specular and diffuse, sorry, it will work with multiple lights. If I add this blue light from the crystal, it does work perfectly. Oh boy. So yeah, it's not really that complicated of a shader. It's just little tricks that really make it pop. And then after that, we have the outline shader. The outline shader is the part that I'm a little more iffy of that might change first. So if I set this back, this is how it usually look. Obviously it's being shaded with the lights and stuff and it just doesn't really work. The outline shader is split into two parts. The base outline, which is what we made in Blender, and then a overlap on the top. And you'll see why I say I'm iffy about this. So the first step is to essentially make it so that it is unshaded and pure black. This simply is just the outer outline shader, which looks good, but it doesn't have like any really interesting, like 
it does look interesting, but not interesting enough. It doesn't look like those scratchy pen marks that I usually do. So what we do is that we grab this and we do another pass. I don't know if this would work with Unity. You may have to change up or Unreal or whatever other game engine, but this is how I'm doing it in Godot. And the next pass is our outline shader right here. And this is where magic starts to happen. So I will try to explain. Oh, not magic yet. I need to set the offset screen influence. Okay. This right here is simply just how much it can go into the model, sort of. And then screen influence is just how much screen UV is influencing it. I will explain these. Don't worry. So how the outline shader works is it, it is simply just fragment. No light, obviously. No vertex, nothing like that. It is simply just fragment. How it works is that we grab the model matrix and the offset quantity, and then we do a whole sort of vector crap math or whatnot <laughs> with this. This essentially makes it so that if our offset is like 10, it will stay 10 with the model and get smaller as we zoom out the view, get bigger as we zoom in the view, so that it doesn't just stay super thick if we move out and then super thin if we move in. It stays this sort of consistent size with our model. Then we divide it by the linear depth. This is the part I'm most iffy about. I'm going to be honest, I don't know what linear depth does. <laughs> I just sort of plugged it in and it worked. I assume this is also helping out with making it so it stays consistent with size, but I am going to be honest, I, I, I don't know what linear depth does. I don't know if this will break. I don't know if this will completely like fail in certain situations. But it's worked so far in all my tests, so I'll keep it that way. If it works, don't touch it. <laughs> so we divide it by the viewport size. Why? Because we are going to be using the screen as a texture. So by dividing by the viewport size and using screen UV and yada yada, we can get sort of this pixel's position in terms of the screen and not just the model. And this is where the weird chick happens. I'm using a combination of visual and code here, so I'll try to explain that. Essentially, we grab the screen texture, and we go over here, and we have a sort of little tolerance. And what we do is that we check octo, sort of, like all, like all around, and then half octo. So what this is doing is that, let's say we're over here. We're this pixel right here. We did the whole thing where it stays consistent. Then it checks the offset for any black color in the eight directions. If there is, then it's colored black. If not, then it is not colored black and it's just left blank. Then the half octo check is the same thing, just half of the offset, so that if the offset is pretty big, like 20, it doesn't completely break apart. So I'm going to set this back to like five. And it also checks the pixel right underneath it. I forgot to mention that. So it checks the pixels all around it in all eight directions, eight directions, half of the offset, so eight directions with the distance of the offset, eight directions, half of the distance of the offset, and then right on top. Then from there, this is fed into here and is multiplied by this noise texture right here. So this noise texture makes it so this is a little more interesting because if we just plug it right into here, it's just solid. So this simply makes it so that, hey, if it's like black or white, it will actually scratch it up because pen marks are scratched up and it adds a little more detail and interest. And then over here, this is what the screen influence is. If we only use the UV of the model, it stays consistent with the model, which is fine, but it can get a little boring and a little messy, especially in places such as like the crystal where it's pretty small. So by mixing it with the screen UV, you get a tiny bit of influence from the screen position and a tiny little influence, well, and a big influence from the actual like UV of the model. So this makes it so that if we move around even close to the crystal, it still gets that little scratchy effect. Very, very important in my opinion. Then this is obviously color ramp, so it doesn't have this weird sort of gradient. And if it's white, it stays. If it's black, it doesn't stay. And then we go over here and simply just clamp it so that it doesn't go over 1 or under 0 because it goes into alpha. And this only works if the culling is turned off. 
I will warn that. So if I go over here, go to the outline shader, if I turn the culling back to its normal back, it doesn't work. We have to use the disabled culling so that it doesn't try to delete any faces and it only sort of makes them transparent with alpha. That is my entire process. I really hope this video can be a resource to some of you or just a demonstration slash flex for myself as well because to get this working I had to think in really weird ways. I had to think outside of the box. I had to be inspired by so many different resources. So I hope that this video can be a resource for someone in the future one day. Now if you're interested in my game that I'm making I have a whole bunch of devlogs on my YouTube channel that you can just go check out on your own time or if you're just interested in the art stuff then you can rewatch this video as many times as you need, follow along ask questions. I will be pretty available to answer questions in the comment section if you do need a little bit more explanation or just a few tips and tricks. So that is all I have. I really hope my art style can shine in my game. And I will see you all later.